Welcome to the latest episode of Putting Things Right from Rebuild. Thank you very much for joining us for our uh, latest episode. I'm joined by Lisa Townsend and uh, Matthew Barber. Uh, we're going to take a selection from uh, the budget, the forthcoming budget, and one of the things that they think the government might be doing when they announce that this Wednesday. Uh, and then we're also going to have some final reflections on the uh, leadership campaign. But you're very welcome. Thank you for joining us. If this is the first time you've been with us, please do follow us and subscribe. If you like it, please do leave a fabulous review because it does help other people find the podcast as well. So you are very welcome for joining us. Things that uh, is a important issue affecting young people is further and higher education. And one of the things which was reported a few weeks ago is tuition fees. It's been a thorny subject now for 20 years, 20 years plus uh, since the last uh, Labour government brought them in. We've had the original tuition fees, then top up fees. And then uh, when we were in government uh, with the coalition, uh, them going up to over £9,000 a year. Now, reports are saying that uh, officials have drawn up papers which will say that tuition fees will be allowed to rise, having been frozen since 2017. Um, then being at the threshold of 9,250 now, their proposals would take them over 10,000 uh, pounds. And that for me is a, is a symbolic number, uh, 10,000 pounds. And more people I think now are gonna start to question 10,000 pounds per year for a degree, plus maintenance loans, plus interest, plus time, was a significant amount of money for probably not very much anymore. And I think the question needs to be asked, what future is there for uh, higher education, further education in this country when tuition fees are so high? Um, I'm going to come to you first, uh, Matthew. Obviously, you know, we, we've all at some stage paid an amount of uh, tuition fees, so we're not the generation that uh, voted for this uh, and done, did it to other people. But it, do you think that that, that 10,000 number it, Think it's going to make any impact for the university sector both in terms of admissions or in terms of income yeah i think i think you're right it is uh getting into the uh, uh the double digits of the of the thousands does uh make it rather symbolic and we were just talking off air that uh, i think lisa you you just avoided um tuition fees uh, matthew and i were that that first couple of years um at university where we did pay but a significantly lower sum uh than uh, than people are paying now uh, and I think it does call into question um, the the future of um, uh, higher education and, and how it's funded really importantly, because we've gone to the days where the government could uh, simply invest public money into um, an elite university system to be the best in the world, uh, to pull talent globally uh, to come to the UK. Because we are, uh, we're now, uh, we built a university system which assumes that a significant minority, if not majority, of people will go through uh, higher education at some stage, and it's no longer about um, about yeah, that real focus on elite education. It's just the the path into employment for an awful lot of people, and that in, a, in, in itself, of course, is not a bad thing. I'm a big fan of education for education's uh, sake, and of course, we want uh, we want a better educated uh, population. That's all for the good. Uh, but uh, yeah, we've got to consider both um, the, what that does for those individuals, how viable uh, that is for them to to run up you know, 30, 40, 50 thousand pounds worth of uh, debt uh, before they start on their careers. Um, and yes, we know you pay it off over time and it's it's probably quite an affordable way, uh, relatively speaking, of, uh, of borrowing money. But that still becomes a significant burden at the start of someone's career. But also from a from a public perspective, um, you know, what's the alternative? Uh, because actually, if we don't want tuition fees to rise, I think there's a real risk for the Conservatives at the moment that we are just we just choose to oppose everything that the government seeks to do uh, without thinking, uh, thinking through what the consequences are. How else uh, do we think that, uh, that the higher education system uh, should be funded uh, going forward if it's going to remain a, a mass system uh, to, to churn out degrees for vast numbers of people? And I don't see anybody really suggesting that shouldn't be the case these days. Um, uh, is there really an alternative to, to individuals paying for their intuition fees because the state surely can't afford it? So what do I think about the proposal of tuition fees going up? Well, 
I mean, look, inflation, you can't keep tuition fees um, uh, locked at a set price forever. They do need to um, keep a pace with inflation. Universities um, have struggled enormously um, post-COVID uh, with a number of them who did rely heavily on overseas student numbers have not seen the return of overseas student numbers at the level that they had previously. So I know universities have been struggling. Inflation has been at all-time high for the last three to four years. Actually, the last three years, I should say, um, although it is clearly... Um, now back down to it's now under the government's target at one point uh, is it 1.7 percent i think it was as of a couple of weeks ago um so i don't i don't actually have a huge issue with an increase in tuition fees what i do have an issue with is the number of people going to university the number of courses that are offered and the quality of degrees and i think that is something that i i do struggle with a little bit more i think young people are coming out of university saddled with you know best part of 30 grand's worth of debt with a degree that's not necessarily um, going to uh, get them a job doing anything specific. Um, And because there are so many generalist degrees now around, does applying for a job as a graduate actually secure secure you an interview over somebody who hasn't got a degree? Um, It probably depends what job you're applying for, because some will clearly be graduate jobs only. But if you're applying for a job where it's a graduate um, entry system only, they're probably looking for certain sorts of degrees maths history geography you know it's probably not going to be communications or you know it, it, it probably they're probably looking for um core subject degrees i would probably uh, argue i mean my son um is 21 he's in his uh third year at university and um within about four or five weeks of starting university um, he uh, was on the phone to my husband and I moaning about the quality of his lecturers, moaning about the fact that one lecturer, he still hadn't met them sort of four or five weeks in, um, didn't know who his who his tutor was, you know, was <laughs> basically said it's just it's just not well organised. The quality of the lectures are poor. Um, he'd done an A-level in the subject that he studied at university and he said that he felt his first year was just a complete overlap of the of the A level that he'd done and didn't really feel like he got anything out of year one. Um year two, yeah, so it went into it went down some different paths. Um he's frustrated now in year three with the choice he's got for his dissertation. Um he thinks it's too narrow. Um the subjects and it's four or five um dissertation um themes that they can follow. Um he he's not overly impressed at all and um he's he penned a long email to the university complaining about the quality of the lecturers and you know and that is a person a young person who is not massively massively academic and my, my son isn't hugely academic but but what he is is a is a decent hard-working kid who's gone to university he wants to make the best of himself who was interested in this subject and has actually felt quite deflated by the whole university process the socializing the living with friends and that part yeah he's he's of course enjoyed and, and loved that particularly after COVID. He was a, a COVID teenager who did his A-levels during um during those those awful years that we had a, a few years ago. But um so actually, you know, I do think that when when it comes to university fees, yes, going putting them up, I don't have a massive issue with that, but we do think we need a rationalization of the number of degrees, the quality of the degrees, and making sure that if you are spending thirty thousand pounds on bettering yourself and taking on thirty thousand pounds worth of debt um in your early twenties that act or whatever age you do a degree, that actually you are getting good value for money because I would argue at the moment that probably um that in terms of value for money score with a, a number of um, university college uh, courses in the country they're probably not necessarily giving that young person a thirty thousand um, pound uh, additional benefit to their their cv and their potential future earning um powers as, as they go through their career so no particular issue with the money going up um but as i say a rationalization of quality and quantity uh, would be what i'd be looking for if i was uh, working as a university's minister uh, I was speaking to um, some sort of physio done on my gammy ankle a couple of weeks ago and the physio was telling me his three children looked at the cost of university and they decided to do apprenticeships instead. And uh, I know that there have been challenges over the years when it comes to apprenticeships. I was uh, working for David Evanett when he was skills minister and we were visiting further education colleges and we had that, obviously that story we used quite a lot in opposition that um you had lots of hairdressing apprenticeships where they didn't even pick up a pair of scissors because it was not in the initial 
um, initial course, but do you think we've sufficiently moved on with further education apprenticeships now where they are a genuine alternative to higher education? What more could we done to perhaps persuade people on, on different alternatives to just higher education? Yeah, I think it's, it's interesting, isn't it, that we're back here again debating a university education. Um, and I think that, you know, like David Evan, other conservative, successive conservative ministers um, have done did a really, really good job, actually, of highlighting um, sort of further education outside of university and the other options that are available. And I think they did great work. And so it is frustrating um, that we find ourselves having this conversation again. Of course, as PCCs, we had the conversation about the value of a degree not that long ago when we were talking about should you know should all police officers have degrees and, and I was very pleased that Surrey took the decision quite early on um, as, as I know others did um, to opt out of that because I don't think police officers should have to have a degree any more than I think nurses should have to or um, or anything else I think Tony Blair was wrong <clears throat> in the late 90s uh, mid 90s um, saying that half of people should have a degree he was wrong then and he's wrong now and you know it's still wrong now um, but of course, it does then come down to to what all the alternatives and as, as conservatives, we must believe in choice. We believe in people having a choice as to what they want to do with their lives um, and university being a very valid choice. What I don't like is the idea of. And yes, I was that that final year before um, before fees cut it and um, hit in. But people having to decide based on cost alone um, can't be right either. Um, but it only becomes a genuine choice when not going to university um gives somebody a very real um option as well and is a very real option and that that both in terms of geographically where you can do it so you're not basing a postcode lottery of what is your local college offering or what is your local business able to offer an apprenticeship um but is actually something that that we're seeing um that we see throughout throughout the uk um and i think that those people who who don't want to go to university um they are still kind of going against the trend and i think we've got to do everything we can to support them as well to do that i mean i sort of remember i was at a comprehensive school in hertfordshire i don't really remember being offered an alternative um i do remember this is terrible i do remember my parents saying to me uh you know oh, if you don't do your homework or you don't revise for your exams then you know you'll have to go to the hairdressing college down the road um i mean the reality is i'd probably have <laughs> probably have ended up much more successful certainly in financial terms had I gone to the hairdressing college down the road um but uh, rather than sort of politics and, and policing and all the things that we do but um yeah I think it's got, it's got to come down to choice and I'm I haven't yet seen anything from this government that says they're, they're really serious about that but I couldn't agree with you more Matthew we cannot be in opposition and oppose for the sake of it we can't just oppose everything that this government does they will have some great ideas we as the Conservative Party I've said it before we do not have a monopoly on good ideas um, and nor do I want to see this government fail to the point where um, young people elderly people we all suffer either I want them to do I want them to do well because I want the country to do well I want all of our constituents to do well um, but I want the Conservatives back in power as soon as is possible. And that means we've got to come out with credible alternatives. We've got to back the government when they're right, but we've got to come out with credible alternatives when we think there is one. Yeah, I think yeah. if I can come back in uh, there, I think one of, one of the things that really frustrates me about this whole issue is the hypocrisy um, of it. And often the hypocrisy when we talk about tuition fees has been framed as uh, yeah, a generation of people who went to university uh, for free, imposing fees on on a, on a new generation. Well, of course, that, that's not quite the case now, because actually we've got people coming through who who will have paid tuition fees themselves, as we've already discussed. But actually, I think the hypocrisy is often around parents. And I will, you know, I'm, I'm a parent of two uh, two girls who are uh, quite a long way off making those sorts of decisions um, as yet. Uh, you, you've got young children, Matthew. Um, uh, a lot, lots of people I know will say, yes, of course, we think apprenticeships are a really good idea. We want those new, more technical um, uh, vocational opportunities for young people. But of course, my children will probably go to university. Um, and and there's a there's a there's a huge level of hypocrisy there of actually, if we want those those opportunities to be really valid choices, as you said, Lisa, it needs to be a choice. Mm -hmm. But actually, it needs to be a choice that everybody would Im really embrace not seen as a second best not the threat of if you don't do your homework you'll end up doing that uh which i think is a perfectly normal reaction for a lot of people uh but you've you've just summed it up perfectly there so it, it needs to be um uh, that when that that you know, the successful uh middle class professional family when that child says do you know what i don't fancy going to university uh, i'm going to go and do uh do a t level or or 
will go and uh, do this course at college instead. We we need to get to a place where that's really embraced um, uh, because I think far too much we're, we're pushing people into a route which isn't necessarily right for them. No, it's not. And it's one of the reasons why I think I felt or I know a lot of us felt so strongly about the um, policing having to have having to have a degree or to, or to gain your degree through policing, because it, it seemed to just fly in the face of um, you know, everything that on the one hand, ministers like David Evan at the time were saying, and of course, it was a Conservative government who brought in PCCs and, and brought in, you know, these, these rules as well around placing and degrees. Um, and it just seemed, again, to use your word, Matthew, sort of hypocritical, because you had people around the cabinet table saying on the one hand well you know it's really important that we're not you don't have to have a degree and that you know we're doing a lot around further education but on the other hand we think you need one to do something like policing or nursing um yeah so yeah i, I think i think i think matthew's word of hypocritical is is a good one well I, i'm not sure if i'm going to fit into that that category of hypocritical now <laughs> but I've got some evidence to back up my decision. So unless I'm going to be proven wrong in the next 11 years, my daughter wants to be a paleontologist and there are currently no paleontology apprenticeships in the UK. So there are no vacancies, certainly. So if we can find one in the next 11 years, great. If not, I'm I'm not sure whether I qualify as a hypocrite or not. But it is important, um, you know, that we I think the diversity of choice is the most important thing, but quality choices that give people you know genuine opportunities going forward i think is going to be um is going to be key and i think lisa's right you know when they when the government says things which we agree with we should agree with them uh, if we disagree with them we should say why we should do instead what are our, what are our guiding principles and um, obviously next week uh, the week after we will have some when we have a new leader uh, and that brings me on to my next question um by the end of this this week, that when this episode comes out, we'll have a new leader of the Conservative Party, uh, either uh, Kemi Badnock or Robert Jenrick. Uh, I think we've all got a feeling which way it's going based on our conversations with uh, members, etc. But I have to set some some guiding principles for that. But um, as we enter the last week, what have you been your views of the the campaign for the last two? Lisa, I'll come to you first. What how do you think the last the the, the last two have been in this campaign? um it, it's been interesting i'll give it that um i think yeah we've been bombarded haven't we as members with lots of stuff um we've had an opportunity as police and crime commissioners um to, to meet with both candidates which i think is great i know both candidates certainly around surrey um have been you know out and about meeting members and giving members an opportunity to come and hear what they have to say um you know and i'm conscious that both candidates have um they must be exhausted right they are they cannot be getting much sleep at the moment they're traveling all over the country and of course i think most of us have probably most of us as members have probably voted now actually either, either by post or, or online I've, well. not yet, I've not voted yet have you not voted i've been, that, oh, okay. no, I've been, I've been that torn okay. because well i was never going to vote henrik uh i was unsure about voting for kemi i've yeah. not voted I'm not voted not yet, voted and that's that. really well, bizarre for me. I hope you do vote. Oh, I will. I will. I will. Um, but I do think that given most members have voted now, um, certainly all the members I spoke to have voted, um, I do feel, because of course every trip out that they do and sort of late night that the candidates do is sort of the sort of diminishing returns, because they'll be turning up mm -hmm. to rooms full of people who have largely voted. I, I, I was very open right from the beginning that I would, um, probably from the final six that I would vote for if Jenrick made it into the final I would vote for whoever wasn't Jenrick um, and so I have uh, I have thrown my my vote behind Kemi um, and I really really hope and actually believe that she will win and um, I think she's I think she's actually saying the right things I thought at the interview that she did in the Times it was on Saturday last week week four was a really good strong one actually had I been neutral on the fence I think that would probably have swayed me in her direction um, and likewise, on the other side, and some of the stuff I've seen Robert Jenrick and his campaign come out with, I, I'm afraid it smacks a little bit of somebody who's desperate and knows he's losing. And um, at the risk of sort of, you know, uh, laying my cards fully on the table there, some of the things he's come out with, I've just thought, oh, no, don't do that. You know, because because whatever happens in this contest, of course, we do all have to come back together um yeah. at the end of all of this and and i want to see you know i want to see the conservative party and i want to see the leadership whoever that may be and i hope it's kenny but i want to see them making use of all the talents within the party 
Um, and I am sure there is a role for, for Robert Jenrick if he doesn't win the leadership within the party still. Of course, there has to be. So I do, I do, I hope that we can all come together. But um, I have to say, God, guys, I'm glad it's nearly at an end. Well, I was uh, now, unfortunately, I cannot reveal whether or not one of us is going to be right about this context, because if you remember back to yeah. when this all kicked off and I said, your predictions well one of you <clears throat> the final two of the as the winner somebody has picked one of the final two as the runner-up so there's still all to play for although what i will say and quite worryingly for your section 151 officers one of you can't add up to 100. um so um i'm not going to come there but matthew any final reflections on on the last week of the campaign what should what yeah. should they be doing now in the last week what should they be doing I think I think you're right. Or you know, as Lisa's just said, it seems like a very long time. Now I think that was the right thing to do. I think to you know, we we discussed this uh, when we first launched rebuild, didn't we? That actually a really quick contest would have been the wrong thing to do. We have time. Still, nobody wants to listen to what the Conservative Party's got to say. We didn't need to rush into this. So I think it's been the right thing to do, but that doesn't make it any less exhausting, uh, particularly as you said for those those involved. I mean, on a personal level, it's it's been a pretty arduous campaign uh, for anybody, uh, and and at the end of it, all the winner gets is one of the most thankless jobs in British politics, being leader of the opposition. So um, uh, they're they're fighting over over a bit of a poison chalice to some extent. I think what I really hope remains the case is, by and large, it's been a it's been a relatively amicable campaign. I do say relatively because I think you're right, Lisa. It started to to fray at the edges in a few places, probably because people are getting a bit tired and a bit desperate. Um, and there is only a week to go, so hopefully that all remains calm. Because whatever happens, we do need to unite, whoever it is. Um, I pin my colours to the mast um, uh, on this, as, as you have, uh, Lisa. I, I'm supporting Kemi and organised uh, an event for her to come to, to my local constituency uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and I think she performed uh, very well. I was very open. She wouldn't have been my. Uh, she wasn't my first choice at the start of the of the campaign. But actually, um, I, I kept my powder dry because this is the stage at which members get a choice. So that now it now seems the right time for for us as members to have a view. Um, uh, but I think what's really important is whatever happens. And I I tend to think uh, that you're right that that Kemi will win. Um, that's not just because I support her. I, I look around and talk to people, and that's the feeling I get. Uh, yeah. But I never like to count my chickens on any election a week out, uh, and who knows uh, what could happen uh, in the in the next um, uh, seven or eight days. So uh, I think we'll have to see uh, see what uh, what does take place. Uh, but keeping it keeping it friendly and amicable um, is really important. I think uh, I think you're right. Kemi's uh, strengths. I think she. I've seen more of her during the campaign, which suggests. Um, she's not just uh, saying things for effect that actually uh, a lot of the stuff she's coming out with I think is, is probably a bit unpalatable, unpalatable to some in the party uh, yet she's willing to say it and I think that's a, a strength um, whereas I think from from Jenrick's team uh, everything seems to be hanging on uh, leaving the H uh, the European Court of Human Rights and if we can do that that's going to solve all of the problems uh, that we've got as a country, and I think that's a vast oversimplification of, of where we are. You know, we need a we need a real uh, a, a real change of direction uh, for the party. We need to rebuild, as as we know. Um, uh, that's why we've we've started this group, and I think uh, I think Cam is the one to deliver that. Well, my reflections on the Conservative uh, Party leadership contest. Well, first of all, uh, a week away from the final announcement of the new leader. I'm just looking forward to it being over, to be honest with you. It's been quite possibly one of the longest party leadership contests uh, I can I can remember in the almost 20 years that I've been involved in politics. Um, it, it's been quite astonishing, actually. But um, on a serious note, both of the final candidates, um, you know, Kemi Badenoch, and Rob Jemrick. I wish them the best of luck for not just for next week for the result, but also to whoever wins for the enormous job they've now got ahead of them. Um, and I think probably the most important thing for them to do is to be reforming central office. It is to be making sure that we are at cutting edge of the digital campaigns, digital technology uh, and use of in reaching young people. We need to remain relevant. We need to be an effective opposition. We need to have policy, but we need to not be seen to attack too much. We need to deal with... Um, 
um, uh, bringing donors back on board. We need to be rebuilding grassroots. We need to truly love and bless our members um, because without them, we are nothing. Um, but th- what the leadership contest has thrown up for me is, is a number of quite interesting things, really. Namely, that such a small parliamentary party, one of the smallest parliamentary parties we've had in uh, 150 years, um, with just 130 members of parliament. And I look at that and I think, how can um, a a party with a membership that is apparently in excess of 130,000 members across uh, the United Kingdom, how can we um, allow 130 people to be making decisions about such an important decision as the future of our um, of our party, the future leader, by whittling them down to two. Why is it that those 130 people are so much more important than everyone else when we are supposed to be reflective of a true membership party? So whatever happens, I really hope that the new uh, party leader empowers a new party chairman. And if that's Rob Jemrick, then he's already declared that that would be James Cleverly, if James accept, accepts the job, obviously. But I think James would be a great person to be party chair because he's popular, he rapport builds, he listens, you know, he he has been a councillor, he's been at different layers of government and he understands what it's like to walk the streets, knock doors and he is not someone who has been a staffer in parliament and uh, worked his way up the ranks through CCHQ maybe, he has actually gone out and done it through local government whilst working in publishing and other things that he did. So anyway, for me, um, where I am on the conservative spectrum, um, you know, either Rob Jenrick or uh, Kemi Badenock, um, e- e- either for me, um, I can absolutely live with. But I am a self-declared Jemrica, um, so I, <laughs> I did um, join Team Jemrick, um some six, seven weeks ago, um, and mostly because of his position on, uh, which came to light after. I actually have to say, but his position that he came out with on the ECHR. You know, I want Britain to be a true, proper sovereign nation. I love parts of, I love things within the Human Rights Act. It's a brilliant piece of legislation. Um, but if we did copy and paste that into the British Bill of Rights, what it does mean is that when there is ever a determination that we're not happy about the um, our sovereign parliament, which it should be sovereign, it's not at the moment still, our sovereign parliament would then be able to um, amend the law as British people want, as the government of the day want, to make sure that we're able to deliver laws that fit are fitting for us. And hence the Rwanda policy would have not been uh, caught up in, you know, almost um, 18 months worth of legal wranglings um, with the European Court of Human Rights. So I'm going down a bit of a rabbit hole there. Uh, But really, for me, I think 3% uh, commitment on GDP spend on defence is key. I think uh, keeping Penny Morden in the the fold and getting her to do a big review of CCHQ is is key. Um, And, you know, I think for me, Jemrick is is, is not quite maybe perhaps as far um, on the right of the party as Kemi is. But I do believe that he, um, I do believe that he is someone who is going to be able to rally, deliver policy, keep us relevant um, nationally. Uh, try and engage um, young people, although I do think Kemi would be very good at engaging young people as well. I really do. And she surprised me in her popularity over the last two to three weeks, particularly. But from where I am on the conservative spectrum, either of those two finalists for me is is perhaps a, is a gift. So um, I'm looking forward um, and, and wish the very best of luck to whichever of the two of them ends up winning next week. And uh, I'm also hoping that they get some a bit of a break because they have been non stop uh, since before the local election, straight into a general and now straight into a leadership campaign. They've both got kids and family time when you're in politics is really, really important. So good luck to both of them for next week. And I'll clearly be looking forward to the result. I should probably get off the fence now and say I will vote. I've never not voted in any any contest. I'm not going to be daft and do a spoiled ballot or writing candidate. I'll vote for Kemi. Of the two, I think she's the better choice. I think she experiences greater scrutiny than I think many other politicians do, uh, not least because she's a woman and has opinions. I think people tend to give women more attention for that. That's unfair. They don't give men the same level of scrutiny or criticism. Um, and I think she ha- she deals with it really well. She's very, um, you know, she's got, I think she has got some good ideas. She, she's building a campaign around principles rather than just, um, yeah, you know, we're, we're going to build more houses. And by the way, do you know I want to leave the ECHR? Um, it's, yeah, I, 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 I think it's obvious for me now which way I'm going to go. And I wish her every success should she be elected next week. Um, there you go. See, live, shifting, floating voters live on air.
Yeah, exactly. You've convinced one other. Um, democracy yeah, that it's exactly exactly well i was never not going to vote and having said i couldn't vote for robert jenrick i think by process of elimination um uh that was obvious but no thanks everyone for joining us for this edition of uh, rebuild uh putting things right podcast like i say if this is the first time you're finding us please do follow and, and subscribe uh, sign up for our uh, whatsapp group as well all the links will be in the show notes for this and if you've got any questions for us do send them in to contact at rebuilduk.online we'd be more than happy to answer them for you um, please do get in touch if there's uh, anything you might be interested in so thanks once again uh, and we'll see you again next week